quiz you on these. Yep. Really, the only new things we saw today were the rep stos and rep move fs, right? And I think we covered those plenty fine. So, and the leave instruction. So, moving along, now we're going to uh, see some of the equivalent things in uh, on Linux systems. So, uh, the first thing is that we will be moving from Intel syntax to AT&T syntax. So I already sort of made reference to this when I had to point out that, you know, in Intel syntax, you take the thing on the right and you put it into the thing on the left, right? Um, and so in AT&T syntax, everything's backwards and it's just there to confuse you. Unless you learned it this way in the first place, in which case Intel syntax is there to confuse you. So, uh, one difference, for instance, this exact same instruction, whereas ESP moved over here to EBP, here it's ESP moves over here to EBP, right? So exact same instruction, just backwards. And you also see that we put these little percent signs onto the uh, registers. And here we actually see a dollar sign on an immediate. So this is one of the, you know, there's only a couple of things that I like about uh, the at and syntax. And one of them is that they put the dollar sign on the immediate to call it out. And that kind of says, look, there's going to be, you know, a hex 14 embedded into your instruction stream right there. Over here, you know, you frequently see just addresses represented, you know, a, a number could be an address and a number could be an immediate. There's no distinguishment there, right? So, and then again, now this is what makes it a little tricky here, right? This is add ESP plus 14 into ESP, right? And so, you have to keep in mind that it's sort of backwards of the way it was before because that, that doesn't matter so much here, right, with the add, but for your subtract instruction, it definitely matters whether you do 14 minus ESP or if you do ESP minus 14 and then put it into ESP, right? So you have to keep track that even the order of operations, shall we say, is backwards here in this representation, right? So it's not you know, going from normal uh, left to right that we're used to, right? You don't take the thing on the left and have the thing on the right subtracted from it. You take the thing on the right and have the thing on the left subtracted from it. Right? So just keep that in mind, basically. And, uh, yeah, I think this slide really needs to be more at the beginning because this is where I say I use Intel syntax everywhere except now. So, whatever. But, yeah, so it is important. So part of the reason for this Linux section, uh, part of it's, you know, just to get you exposure to if you happen, you know, some people are going to be doing it in there and I just want to, you know, give it a little bit of time to doing it in that environment as well. You know, all the Windows people who want to be reverse engineers, you know, this doesn't necessarily matter to you except for the fact that <coughs> when you uh, read, look at talks and things like that, so if you look at security conference talks or you know, academic research papers and things like that, you have no guarantee in which format things are going to be. So if, you know, someone puts into their research paper a little snippet of assembly code of why this or that is the case and the assembly code is their proof of something happening or not happening with the compiler, you need to be able to read that just as well, whether it's AT&T syntax or Intel syntax. So getting a little exposure to AT&T syntax is good. But this is the thing that I really hate about uh, AT&T syntax. For those RM32 values, which before we said was a nice base plus index time scale plus displacement, everything's inside the angle brackets. Now for AT&T syntax, you move the displacement outside of regular parentheses and then you have sort of no notion that it's index time scale, right? And you don't know there's plus signs in between things, right? So it's still base plus index time scale plus displacement. It's just left to you to remember which things are pluses and which things are multiplies and stuff like that. And remember, just like in Intel syntax where each of these things can potentially be optional, right? So I may have, you know, index times zero plus displacement and the thing may display it as base plus displacement. Here it could be, you know, just base and displacement over here or I could have, you know, base plus index time scale with no displacement. So there may be no displacement off here outside of the parentheses. So it may be, you know, just calculate what's inside the parentheses. It may be calculate what's inside the parentheses and then add in what's outside of the parentheses 
and that's your address. Now go to memory, right? So that's a bit confusing at times. Um, you actually saw a good example of this in, um, well, you didn't know you were seeing it, but in Dave's 64-bit uh, stuff, uh, his thing, rather than this, like this right here, this is the nice way that they can say it. Your displacement, they can say, you're displaced by negative E8. Okay, that's good. Or they can say, you're displaced by FFFFF something which is negative E8, right? So negative 1 minus, you know, E8. So FFF minus E8, whatever that is. I don't know, 0, 8, 1, 8, something like that. FFFFF 1, 8, something like that. Uh, so yeah, this is the nice form, but some disassemblers are not going to give you the nice form. They're going to give you the negative displacement as a negative number with all the Fs. Yes? Uh, what is the star? There? What is the star here? This is now just another um, syntactic thing where it's trying to say like, well, so this is actually has to do with the, uh, with the call instruction here. So this is sort of one of the more nasty forms that I could give you. Uh, we said there were multiple forms of the call instruction. There's relative and absolute. And relative just means like whatever my next instruction is, I want to go some amount relative. When we listed out all those forms, the fourth one was call absolute indirect. And that meant, you know, go through some register potentially and go wherever that register is pointing. Well, it's not actually a register. It's an RM32. So you can have up to this most complicated form of an RM32 here. And you're saying, Calculate everything in there, go to memory, get what's in memory right there, and treat that like an address, and I'm going to call to that address. So this star here, I believe, is trying to say, like, dereference this RM32, go to memory at that location, and then uh, call whatever's there. But you see, they don't even, they don't put that for, like, the move one, right? So they don't put the star to say dereference for this other case. It's only, like, with that call instruction. So. Yeah, like I said, that's one of the, the nastier forms that I can give you. But um, like the move instruction, for instance, this is what we saw before. And I said I wasn't paying it, you know, I wasn't pointing out this D word pointer. I was just leaving that off most of the time. Uh, but that will start to matter on the uh, at and syntax because, like I said, it can, like, call it move or it can call it, like, move L, right? The L would be to try to say this is move along and... Uh, Actually, I think, I feel like it would be move W in GDB because a word is 32 bits as far as they're concerned. So stuff can get a bit confusing there. Was a question? Yeah. So in the AT&T index, the move always means what move the word? No. So, well, so, so that, it definitely is disassembler dependent, essentially. So sometimes it'll be kind of implied, like, you know, okay, well, I'm using 32-bit registers, for instance. Sometimes they'll add on a uh, little L or something like that to indicate like the length of the thing, but move L is sometimes, like I said, it's, so it can be confusing and it's kind of, sometimes you have to kind of go based on inference. It, it's more an issue, it's not so much you have to infer if you're using one program continuously like GDB, you'll see, here's how GDB represents it, that's fine. Uh, but then if you use obsdump or something like that, obsdump may give a different representation basically. So they use a different mnemonic. Alrighty, and then, you know, again, just here's sort of a nice form. It's still using like an RM32, for instance, and it's doing the nice EBP negative 8, right, displaced by, or EBX displaced by negative 8. But uh, we can also see that in some tools. I guess I didn't try this in the last class, and I should. I think Objdump is the one which puts it in the non-nice form, as we saw by Dave's uh, example code. So I'll show that when we get there. <coughs> Yeah, so this is what I was saying here where, and, you know, it says this, but I think that's different in GDB. So potentially this is where you see this size, um, you see appending this little size indicator onto the mnemonic for the instruction. So rather than putting like D word pointer in line with the things, you know, if you're doing a move byte, it may do move B, something like that. If you're doing a move long, it may do move L, or if you're doing a move word, it may do move W. But we're going to have to see whether this holds, because like I said, now, last time I was using GDB, I thought it didn't do this. So. Well, no, maybe that has to do with the format specifiers. Yeah, okay. So, yes? I'm going to regret asking this, but what does it mean when I get a command that actually has a W and an L attached to it? 
attached to it? I have no idea. Okay. The question was, what does it mean when there's a W and an L on an actual instruction? So I double checked, and the one I got yesterday it was in fact move SWL. Move SWL, interesting. So what it would mean is, in those sort of ambiguous cases, this is why, in some sense, I like this the um, tersity, and there's a better word than tersity, brevity. I like the brevity of this, you know, let's just tack on to say, okay, we're definitely dealing with a byte or two bytes or four bytes, right? In some sense, I like that. But in the, due to the fact that we have um, different things using different mnemonics, that's where it gets confusing and that's when it becomes a detriment rather than a benefit. So what I would do in that sort of case, as we'll talk about at the, towards the end of the class, is I would go back to that behind the scene byte and say, like, what byte was this really and what does Intel say it is? Or I would literally like tell my thing, print it for me in Intel syntax right now so I can see what, what Intel syntax thinks it is. So, yep. All right. So on Linux systems, your go-to compiler is going to be GCC, right, the new, uh, new C compiler. Um, and this is available, you know, for most Nix systems. Uh, as well as OS X, Solaris, and everything else. Um, and it supports many architectures besides x86, so you can, you know, when you're looking at, like, MAN for GCC, the problem is then you have a bunch of options for a bunch of other architectures that you're not using, right? So you need to be careful when you're searching for options that you want to pass to GCC. You got to look, like, are these x86 options? Are these everybody options? And that sort of thing. Um, but the main option we're going to care about, as far as this class is concerned, is the dash GGDB option. So this is saying output uh, debug symbols onto this binary. So attach debug symbols to this binary, which are appropriate for reading, you know, GDB should be able to read these debug symbols. So there's a lot of different formats you can output debug symbols in, but dash GGDB should say, you know, give it something that GD GDB is going to read. And then, you know, I just say that generally speaking, as opposed to Visual Studio where you know, you have all that nice little GUI where you select this or that, but I said behind the scenes, selecting this or that is still just passing a bunch of command line arguments. In GCC, you just pass a bunch of command line arguments, and typically you wrap that into something like a make file where you set up, you know, whereas in Visual Studio, you set all your stuff and then that's your set configuration. In uh, GCC, you'll typically have a make file where that'll specify what options you want to pass, what files you want to put together, in what way, and stuff like that. So, so the one thing I should say, you know, if you're going to be looking at Linux, etc. So this book is sort of fairly Linux specific. And, um, you know, AT&T syntax specific. But uh, the reason why I wanted to still have a book for you is so that uh, you could see the alternate descriptions, right? So for all those places where I said, you know, book page 53 and stuff like that, you know, you can go in and you can look at, like, what it says about, you know, the different jump instructions, what it says about uh, the move instruction or something like that, so that you can get an alternate uh, perspective rather than just going straight to the manual or something like that. And then it has, you know, just additional good information as well. All right, so the basic usage of GCC, as far as we're going to use in this class, well, the basic usage is GCC-O output file name, and that can be on either side of the input file name, actually. But, and so you just do dash O for whatever you want the resultant binary to be named, and then input file name would be either, you know, one or many input C files. We're only going to have our very simple examples in this class, so just single input name, single output name, and uh, that's what we're going to do. And then we would also add in the dash GGDB. So a final thing that we might do in our Linux VM is GCC-GGDB means add some debug symbols onto it. Call our output binary example one, right? We typically don't do like .exe and stuff like that on, on Linux. Uh, and then just example one is my input source file. All right. And so objdump is kind of your uh, go-to disassembler for viewing the entirety of the disassembly of a binary in Linux. So object, uh, object dump and object file could be potentially even intermediate linking files, like objects that are post-compilation but pre-linking, so you haven't, like, taken a bunch of stuff and put it together into a final binary, you can still dump those out with objdump. But uh, for as far as we're concerned in this class, 
the objects which we're going to dump are just binaries that are generated as the output of GCC. And those are, for, for what it's worth, those are ELF files, the executable and linking format. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a bunch in uh, Life of Binaries class. And actually, I should say to the people on the phone, no, that's the intermediate class. Yeah, so the, for the people who are doing remote as well, um, you know, I saw a lot of you were not signed up for the Life of Binaries class, but I think you probably do want to be because um, the Life of Binaries class, again, is something which is going to help feed into the reverse engineering stuff. So if you're taking this remote and, you know, you thought this was sufficiently uh, useful, I think you'll find the Life of Binaries class as well. So go sign up for that. All right. So one thing about objdump that's useful is this dash m intel thing. So you can override the default AT&T syntax in order to actually see it in Intel syntax so that you can flip back and forth if necessary in order to do it. So uh, Ariel, if you are using objdump to find that thing, try doing like objdump with uh, this thing. What? I just did. Yep. And it switched from move SWL to move SX. There we go. So I know what that is. That's the sign extend version of move, right? So. So, yeah, so we'll come back to that maybe. But, but that's really weird that it doesn't do just SX. That's what Intel says in its manual, move SX, whatever. All right. So dash M, Intel will override the thing. So, for instance, here's a simple example of, you know, my hello world. I do objdump dash D, hello. I get this, this init. That's the thing I've been sort of making reference to. That's the function which is called before main potentially. We saw it was named something different for Visual Studio, but there's always this initialization of the C runtime library that goes on before you actually get into main. And so there's init, and then dot, 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 eventually you'll get down. It's basically, it starts at the top, runs all the way to the bottom, just trying to disassemble as much stuff as it possibly can. And so if I flip this to dash M Intel, then this is the equivalent stuff, right? So I see here, like I had end ESP and FFFFF0. Back here, I had end, you know, this dollar sign FFFF0 saying that's like an immediate. It's just some constant that's hard coded in here, right? So maybe I have this LEA ESP plus four. And I don't remember that this is an ESP plus four. Go to memory. Well, not go to memory. Sorry, it's an LEA, right? So don't go to memory. Just calculate ESP plus four. Put that address in ECX. And if I want to see it the other way, right? ESP plus four into ECX, right? Back and forth. ECX minus 4. Well, no, here objdump did the negative 4, so I don't know what your objdump is doing. Anyways, so that's the back and forth with that. Um, so I'm going to actually show that now. Um, I'm trying to decide how I do this so that I don't just like talk through everything. All right, so you have a uh, Ubuntu VM on your desktop. So you've got VMware player link on your desktop. Double click on that. And it's going to bring up Ubuntu VM. For everyone who's doing it remote, you know, I sent you the link to download the VM and you can run this in VMware Player on, you know, Windows or Linux, whatever. So, uh, you know, from within VM Player, you know, we all in the labs will have just this little Ubuntu thing already in our, our inventory. For people out there, you're going to have to specifically go, you know, file an open virtual machine. But for everyone else, you have Ubuntu, just go ahead and hit play. A virtual machine, or I think it was, well, I don't know what it was. But so now you're going to get a couple of errors because this is set up to like use a virtual floppy drive, but we don't have a floppy drive. So that's fine. It says, do you want to try to connect this device? No, because it's just going to error out again. Okay, so no more virtual floppy trying to start every time. Get out of there. I think there might be another error. Maybe, maybe not. What was that? Yeah, yeah. So this is going to take a while. So going to let that go. And then once we get this up, then uh, we're going to do a quick example of this compilation that I was talking about, as well as the using objdump. So we will uh, we'll go back to doing this, the GCC example one, and we'll have to go find our example code, which should already be in the VM. And then we'll go forward and we'll do like objdump dash d example one for instance. So when it comes up, go ahead and use the standard username password that we have for the. And I would recommend uh, probably.
probably drag it to be relatively large. Else once it comes up. Because you'll want it bigger so that you can see more GDB scroll back and more obj dump output, etc. Ready? Yeah, there we go. So once it comes up, you probably want to expand it to most of the screen. You got your uh, sample code that just double click on that example zip. It'll open in this little window. Drag that onto your desktop so that we expand uh, the zip file. And then once you've got your expanded code on your desktop, go into applications. Uh, let's see, where is it? Was it internet? Nope. Accessories and then terminal. And uh, I frequently like drag this to my desktop or something like that so that I don't have to go into the menu ever again. So I'm going to drag that terminal onto my desktop and then open it. So again, applications, accessories, terminal, drag it to your desktop, drag it to your bar up here, whatever you want to do. All right, and then uh, once you get your terminal window up, you're going to do CD desktop and CD intermediate, uh, well, intro ASM code for class, and then example one. <coughs> and for those who don't work in Linux, you can use tab completion. So you just type the beginning of desktop and then you hit tab. And then you type the beginning of intro and then you type tab. And you type the beginning of example. And then there's multiple examples. So we just type example one. And there's no such file. All right. This is the one that doesn't have example one. So we're going to go to example two. Man, I'm working on that too much. And so when you're in example two and you do ls, you will see your example 2.c and then you'll see all that other like Visual Studio crud that we don't care about anymore. All we care about is that we have this, sim this uh, single example 2.c. We can do like cat example 2.c and that'll show us the source code that's in it, right? And so recall that that was the one where we did, you know, the two times x plus y and it got turned into an LEA and things like that. Everybody got this up? All right. So now do GCC space dash GGDB space dash dash O, right? Where we're going to call our output binary example 2 and then just uh, example 2.c. So I'm going to expand that. Right. So GCC dash GGDB dash O example two space example two dot C. All right. That compiles our binary with uh, no fuss, no muss. All right. And so now we can do something like obj dump dash D example two. And then you don't have to, but I would recommend piping it to less so that it doesn't just like spew the entire disassembly all at once. So if I don't pipe it to less, what I get is this. Bam, it like printed it all out and then, you know, plopped me at the end. Or if I pipe it to less, then I get this and I can scroll using my arrow keys up and down, right? I could scroll anyways before, but whatever. I can now search this as well, right? So again, we see that, you know, this disassembles it. It starts, it has the init and it has all the code for that. Uh, let's see. Where does init called? Hmm. Well, there's start. Okay, anyways. So there's init and then there's start and then eventually if we keep scrolling down, eventually we'll find sub. That was that subroutine that did the 2x uh, times y or 2 times x plus y, right? And this is interesting here. We see that we uh, 
we don't have this generating an LEA instruction like we did before, right? Before we had that ECX plus EBX times two or whatever it was. This generated completely different assembly. Said I, I'm going to do some sequence of adds in order to get the same result, right? And then we have main and we have the call to A2I and <coughs> stuff like that, the call to sub, et cetera. And so this is, you know, Intel syntax and if I want I can turn the, or sorry that was eight, uh, 18T syntax. If I want, I add the dash capital M, Intel, and then fail. Lowercase i on your Intel. Right, so obj dump dash capital M space lowercase Intel. And then you get something like this where everything's in nice, clean, aesthetically pleasing Intel syntax. Unnecessary. All right. Well, how do I know if I'm doing a mod or something like that? You'll see what I have against percentage signs when we get to the inline assembly, actually. So, all right. So this was just our, our basic first thing, right? We compiled the binary and we can dump out the assembly, right? So, obj dump is our ghetto disassembler. All right. So that was that. Do I have lowercase? Yes, I do. All right, so then next we have um, hex dump and XXD. These are if, you know, for whatever reason you just want to see like hex dump. I don't know why, but I mean, you, if you just want to see the bytes, you can see that in obj dump. So if you just want to see hex dump in, for instance, the canonical view where you see the ASCII tied to the, uh, tied to the actual hex bytes, use hex dump dash capital C, dash C for canonical. And if you did that over in your VM, You'd get something like hex dump dash C, example two. I'm going to pass that to less again. All right, and there I can see that. Well, one thing I see right away is that I have some sort of like ELF signature at the beginning, right? Little ASCII ELF. Or, you know, it could be the environmental liberation front. Something like that. Anyways, I can see some strings in here uh, slash lib slash ld linux.so, whatever that is. And I see some other strings. So, you know, sometimes for whatever reason you want to look at hex dump. <clears throat> Personally, though, where available, I prefer XXD. So, <coughs> XXD is my little ghetto uh, disassembler. So, XXD will do a hex dump just like what we saw, and it'll dump it to file. Well, it'll dump it to standard in unless you, it'll standard out unless you redirect it to file. So it'll do a hex dump, but the nice thing about XXD is it'll put this thing out to file if you want, and then you can go modify that file and like just change those bytes in the hex dump, and then you can do XXD-R to go the reverse direction in order to take your little text file that you modified and turn it back into a binary file. So I like that. That's, you know, my simple little hex editor. I used this in the past for like hacking like the uh, airport driver for um, Apple's airport thing to spoof your MAC address. So anyways, XXD, example two. And then if I just do that, it's just going to dump it out like this. And there's actually some other options like if I want to put this one byte at a time with like spaces between or four bytes at a time, but whatever. I do XXD and then I redirect that to a file and I say, you know, my dump, something like that. Then I can open my dump with the lead uh, text editor, nano. Oh no, now the world on the internet knows I use nano. <laughs> VI and Emacs are for wusses or stupid people or something like that. Hate me if you will. I don't care. I don't care what you think. Nano rocks just like pine and it tells you all of its commands right there. Anyways, so like if I wanted, I could, you know, screw this up and I could change the signature to, I don't know, I think this will be uh, Elf, Wolf, or maybe Ellie. Let's go with Ellie, right? So I hit that to be a five. So I think 45 is E because we got E, L, F, and that was a 46, and F is one greater than E. So I hacked that like that, go like that, my dump. 
And I just screwed up like this signature that happens at the beginning, so I'm wondering if Objdump will even like open the file later on. But I can do xxd uh, my dump, wait, dash r, dash lowercase r, my dump. Oh, sorry, is that too low for you guys? Probably. Let's try this. There, no, it's not so low. All right, dash R, and I don't even remember what I'm going to do. I think like that. Yep. I'm going to call this, you know, modified example two. Right, so that dash R thing said, take this file in this, you know, format that XXD recognizes. Take those hex things and turn them back into binary, which I'm going to actually write out. So now I'm going to try dump on modified one. There we go. It says, like, I don't know what that is, but that's not an ELF file. Okay? Well, I'm not going to read that, and I probably can't even execute it. So let's see. So with example two, I can do, like, Example two, and like I said before, I did like 256 as the input. And I do that, and it doesn't tell me what happened. And if I recall correctly, there's something like that. No, nope, that's not it. There's like some command you can issue to like echo out whatever the return value was from the previous thing. I can't remember it at the moment. So that's not going to help me. Anyways, let's try something like uh, hello world. All right, so if I execute hello world, all right, I got to print out. I'm going to do xxd hello. Hack that. Go in the reverse direction. And then let's see if I can even execute hello mod. Yeah. And that's not even an ELF file. Sorry. You hacked it until it uh, wouldn't even execute because it doesn't recognize it as a valid binary file because it doesn't have the right string, the right signature at the beginning. Anyways, that's just saying XXD is your ghetto hex uh, editor. <coughs> All right. So now we'll talk about GDB. This is our go-to uh, debugger on Linux systems or Mac systems as well. And so as a command line debugger, right, this is not going to be all nice like Visual Studio. It's not going to, you know, have a bunch of windows open for you all at once and things like that. Uh, in fact, we, you know, if you don't tell it to, it won't even, like, tell you what the registers are right now. It won't tell you where you're currently executing, that sort of thing. So really, GDB gives you nothing unless you ask for it. Uh, there are some additional things that, you, you know, there are other debuggers and stuff for Linux that you can use if you want that'll have, give you nicer user interfaces. Uh, but I still decided to go with GDB here because you can pretty much guarantee that anything uh, that has something like GCC for code development on it is going to have GDB on it as well. And it's frequently on systems by default. So the syntax for starting a program in GDB is uh, GDB and then just the program which you want to start. But in order to make this useful for us, we're going to talk about using a commands file. So we're going to give a dash x and then a file name. And that file is just basically going to have a list of GDB commands, just the same kind of thing you would type in when you first get into GDB. Things like display this register, display that register, set a breakpoint, things like that. So we're going to put those sort of things into a file and then we're always going to run GDB with this commands file so that it'll always print out whatever we want to see. All right. So yeah, that's just dash x gives the commands file. And this is absolutely essential to using GDB if you're going to use it for any amount of time, which you will be at the end of the day when you're doing your little example thing. 
uh, you want to be using dash x, which has all the commands you want to do. And so it looks like I didn't move the command thing. I want to move that now. I think, there we go. This is what we're going to use as our initial commands file. So go ahead and start uh, either if you grab, grab the slides, copy this into something, but in your uh, Linux VM, you're going to want to have this sequence of commands in some file called whatever you want to call it, but I'm going to call it like command. Command O, command, whoops, paste that in there, and then I have that in my commands file, and I can do in nano, I can do uh, control O and out, etc. Use whatever you want. But I'll come back to this in a second to let you type it out. Or skip ahead in your slides. It'll be in your paper slides and write it out. But I need to move this because I want this to be after that. All right. Yeah, so I recommend, you know, you copy and paste that uh, thing if you don't have a preferred uh, text editor and if you are just using nano, you can copy and paste by doing like uh, control K and something else. Yep, control K and control U. Yep, you can just go to a line, hit control K and then hit control U a bunch of times and you'll get that same line output again. And then just go through and modify the registers. So, for instance, uh, one thing we can see from this is in GDB, registers are going to be prefixed with the dollar sign. Now. So, GDB's uh, writing things has nothing to do with uh, AT&T syntax. It's just GDB syntax. everyone pretty much have it up? Almost. No, I still hear typing. And actually, I'm going to say change this uh, 32XW. Get rid of that. That's like too much. Let's change that to like uh, 16. So, I've got my file in a file just called cmd command. All right, so now I'm going to go back to that example too like everyone else should be in right now. All right, so you should be in example two. You should have your copy of your command file, let's say, in the exact same directory, which I don't right now. So, you can, for instance, execute uh, GDB on example two by doing GDB dash X, your command file, and then example two. And press return. And that's going to start up GDB. And it's going to set a breakpoint because the very last thing you had in your command file was break main. So it's going to say, you know, set a breakpoint at main. That's what we see right here. And then, you know, we can run the program, look at the program. But the main thing I'm going to say for right now is, 
you know, do run. We haven't learned this instruction yet, right? We're going to go through and learn all the commands for GDB. But if you hit run, then you will see this sort of output where you get to see some disassembly. You get to see the registers. You get to see 16 D words worth of the stack and things like that. So that's all I'm saying we're going for with this uh, command file. We want it so that every time we step one instruction at a time, this sort of output is going to be displayed. So I'm going to exit out of there. All right. We'll go back to here. So now we're going to learn about our commands within GDB. So once you're actually inside GDB, the most important command is help. Okay. So you can use help from within there. So if you want, you can do this. You can watch the slides up there and, you know, stay in GDB down here if you want. So you can do something like help. And then that'll tell you all the different uh, types of help you can get. And then you can just keep doing help and drilling down on something. So for instance, I can do help on breakpoints. So help breakpoints. Now it'll list all the different types of breakpoints I can, well, all the commands that pertain to breakpoints. So there's a watch, which is set a watch point for an expression, blah, blah, blah. Got a bunch of those different things. And for each of those, I can then also drill down and say, you know, say help trace. Right? And eventually it'll say, okay, well, trace has a certain form. Trace and then a location. And a location may be a line number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is kind of like a terminal leaf in the help tree, right? Eventually you get to something which says this is the syntax for this command and, you know, there's no other list of commands basically. All right, so help is the most important thing. When in doubt, type help and then just be like, uh, I don't know, I guess I want to look at the stack or something like that and then help stack and then see if anything looks like it sounds like what you want to look at. Etc. So you just keep drilling down. All right. So then uh, the next command, now that we have like this, this uh, command file full of stuff that you don't necessarily understand yet, uh, like we saw, run is the next command you might want to know so that you can just start the executable and it'll do whatever those sequence of instructions are. So there's typically like a long form for everything and there's a short form like you can just type R and that's the equivalent but I will try to use the long form for everything and if you do these long enough eventually you just do the short form, right? So then just as an important note, uh, if you want to pass command line arguments to a program, right? So we have example two and we want to run it with some input. If we don't run it with some input, it's going to crash then what you would do is, you know, run and then your argument vector as normal. So as if you were running it from the command line, you would do run and then whatever arguments you want. So you could, example two, you could do run one or run 256 or something like that from within GDB. I think you can also specify them just on the command line outside, but I'm not sure. I'm going to go check quick. Uh, but there's not a good way to check that unless I set breakpoints and stuff to see that those registers are getting set. So, never mind. All right. Another thing that I found out about recently, which is kind of silly, is start. And start is the equivalent of break main plus run, right? So I put, I had you put a break main inside of your end of your command file. You could just put start there and then it would do break main plus run but I, I kept them separate for now because in some cases, like example two, right, we want to pass some command line things to run. So we just have a separate break main and then I want you to do the run manually uh, and then you can pass command lines or not pass command line arguments, etc. All right. So, you know, if I were, so you can use help display to see like the full description, but you saw display was the bulk of those commands that I had you put in the command file, right? So display prints out a statement every time the debugger stops. So if you hit a breakpoint, it's going to print it out. And then if you do like a step over or step into instruction, you're just executing one instruction and then you're stopping. And so a display will say print out this information each time. And so you saw I had like display EAX, display EBX, display ECX, right? So all of that is just so that each time you step over an instruction, it'll print out all of the uh, 
all of the registers. It'll print out that stack. Uh, display with, uh, with the special format specifier says display instructions, right? So I had to display slash I EIP that says display some number of instructions at EIP. So the format for display is display and then a slash sign and then some format specifier where we'll talk about the format specifier here and then expression. And I need to add a slide for expression, but I haven't done that yet. So anyways, format can be one of the following or some combination thereof. Format could be I, which would say display whatever this expression is, whatever <coughs> is that memory at this expression, display that as a sequence of assembly instructions. So I don't care if they really are assembly instructions or not. Just treat them like assembly instructions and interpret them per you know, the bytes which specify, you know, a push EBP or whatever. So if I see 55, that's a push EBP or whatever it is. And then uh, just, if you see 55 GDB, print out whatever assembly instruction would correspond to that. But so typically you use this just on uh, display slash I EIP and then, um, and then that'll just display a single assembly instruction or the format specifier can use a number, so like 10I and that'll say display 10 assembly instruction. And I didn't fix that either. I should say, no. Does that description sort of make sense? Other than the fact that you don't necessarily know whether you need angle brackets or not, right? That's ambiguous, but does that make sense that part of the format, well, and it's not just one of the following, it can be a combination of the following. Right, so you can have some combo of potentially like X to say, I want to display something as hex. And then I want B to say I want to display a byte as hex. Or I want to display, you know, a half word as hex. So this is where the, where the ambiguity comes in. The format specifiers in GDB do not necessarily match, well, they definitely don't match the Intel sizes. So when GDB says use W for word, GDB means four bytes. And potentially it probably means 64 or Potentially means like 8 bytes or 64 bits and 64 bit one. I've never tried that, but probably, I'm not sure. So this is kind of one of those things where in order to figure out, you know, like how, what, uh, what corresponds to what, you're going to have to like look at the manual probably a bit in order, to, well, either look at this or look at the manual to say, okay, well, how do I display something as a byte? How do I display something as two bytes, etc.? But uh, these are the things so you can do B, H, or W for byte, two bytes, or four bytes. And then X or D for like if you want to display as hexadecimal or uh, decimal. And then S is a very useful one. This says go to memory wherever this expression is and treat this like a string. So what that means is if this is, it means basically print each of these bytes as an ASCII, whatever the ASCII version of that would be, and then only stop when you hit a terminator, a null terminator. Right? Because that's a string. It's some sequence of ASCII bytes followed by a null sign. And so it's just going to keep trying to interpret these things and trying to print them out until it finally hits a null character. So if you happen to be not looking at a string, it'll, it could just print out a bunch of junk and garbage, right? But if you print out a string, it's great. It's nice. All of a sudden, yeah, bam, that memory address is a string. I know it. Right? And then you have number. So number, you could actually print out like two strings. So if you think there's an array of strings, like that argv, you could potentially do two strings and it'll say, okay, I'm going to go to memory. I'm going to like read all of that and that's going to be, you know, one string and then it's going to go to the next byte after the null terminator and then read all that and treat that like the second string. So using this number, you can like display two X bytes or two, you know, decimal words or two strings or ten instructions, things like that. So 
between the format and the expression, that's how you specify what you want to display every time the, uh, every time the debugger stops. And you can use info display to see like what do you currently have set for display. So if I uh, did this, so if I did this command again, and I start out, and uh, I haven't even executed, I haven't started the thing yet, but if I do info display, it's telling me, okay, well, display one, you asked for, you know, 10 binary instructions at EIP, right? We didn't actually put the B, but it's saying that's what it's actually using. So, saying, you know, and this Y is like, is it enabled or not? So, this is enabled, that's enabled, they're all enabled. So, it says your first display was 10 binary instructions. Your second display was, you know, a slash X for EAX, right? And the second one, slash X for that. Ninth one was 16 words, right? So words in GDB are four byte values in hexadecimal starting at ESP, right? So 16 D words as we call them or words as GDB calls it starting there. So info display like that and uh, like I can do undisplay say nine or something like that. And then that deleted that, right? So if I don't want to see anything anymore, if I think that's not useful to me, on display, it deletes it. That's all I want to say about display. All right. Another extremely useful command, and you're going to use this a lot, is X for examine memory. So it's like display in that it takes a format and it takes an expression where that expression is typically, so the big thing about uh, X is whatever your expression is, it's going to treat that like a memory address and it's going to go to that address and it's going to display whatever's at that address, basically. So X is something where it's always dereferencing this memory address and going to memory and displaying whatever is currently there. So always examines the actual memory given by an address in your expression. And you can again just use the format specifiers to say, I want to examine memory as an instruction stream, as a string, et cetera. And so there's X, which dereferences this expression and goes to memory there. And then there's print, which doesn't dereference it. It just kind of, you know, so if X is move, right, it goes to memory. Print is LEA. It doesn't go to memory. So it just says, you know, it'll, if you can maybe give some calculation, like your expression may be like EBX plus EAX or something like that. So print slash X maybe. Uh, EBX plus EAX, and then it'll just calculate, add those together, and print out whatever the result value is. So we have a couple examples right here. So this is where, again, this syntax can be a little confusing, but on the right-hand side of that slash, right, that's all format specifier, right? So the X over here means examine memory. The X to the left means examine memory. The X to the right means display it as hexadecimal. Right, because per the previous thing, I said you can have a hex format specifier, X, or a D format specifier, D. Right, so examine memory as hex at EBP. So it's going to take EBP, whatever's in that register, it's going to say, I want to treat that like a memory address. Go to that memory address and examine what's that memory there. And so what happened here is EBP happened to contain BFF, BC, B78. So that's what was in EBP, but X says examine the memory at that address. And so then it says in memory at that address is BFF, BC, BE8. Right? And that's probably a saved uh, frame pointer from the previous thing, right? Because those EBPs are always pointing at the previous frame pointer, right? That's that linked list. That's why they kind of look like they're the same, both stack addresses, roughly in the same range, et cetera. Right? But if I did print slash X rather than X slash X, it's not going to go to memory. It's just going to say, okay, well, EBP is BFF, BC, B78. And then alternatively, let's pretend that I had the number one in EAX, right? And I did X slash X EAX. It's going to try to go out and examine memory at the memory address one. Well, for this current process, the memory address one is not valid. Nothing's stored there. So X is just going to say, sorry, can't go to memory at that address. That's not, there's nothing there. But print is fine with it. Print just says, I'm going to print out the one which is in this register. So, you know, think of it either way. I, I think of them like move versus LEA. One of them goes to memory, one of them doesn't. But 
Do whatever works for you. Um, all right, so then we have a variety of commands to actually uh, set breakpoints. And actually, hold on, I'll see how many I have more before you can get you to lunch. All right. So then we have a bunch of commands for breakpoints. So obviously, just like in uh, Visual Studio, you potentially, you know, Visual Studio, you had a GUI click where you said, I want to break right here. Uh, in GDB, you use break or the B command. Uh, and the big thing here is, if you have debugging symbols, right, everything we're going to have has debugging symbols, you can issue things which have symbol as uh, sort of the destination where you want to break. So you can do break main just like you have in your command file right now, right? But let's say you're trying to reverse engineer something on Linux, like we're going to be doing with our example at the end of the day. Uh, you won't necessarily, have, well, I guess our example at the end of the day does have symbols, but you won't necessarily have symbols for the thing, and therefore you can't just do break main. Um, so potentially you have to give a hard-coded address, and you want to say, I want to stop at this address exactly. In that case, the syntax here, and probably should uh, put a space here so that it's, everything is on the same line. Right, so with symbols, the syntax can be just break on some symbol, whatever address, break sub, break main, break mem copy, something like that. If you want to give a specific address, it's B and then star and that address. So you have to put the star before, otherwise it'll get confused and it won't set the right breakpoint on the right address. And one other miscellaneous note here, GDB's interpretation of where a function begins, if you have symbols enabled and you say break main, it assumes you really want to break when main starts doing something. And so all of that compiler generated, push EBP, move ESP to EBP, whatever, all of that gets skipped over. So when you do break main, it actually says, okay, after you've done all that, after you've pushed your callee save registers, after you've allocated your local variables, I'm going to set the breakpoint on that instruction rather than the very first instruction. So I'll show how we can actually see that in this uh, thing. Wow, that's a fast timeout. Right, so going to execute this again with uh, gdb-x, your command file, and example two. You do that, it did break main, right? That's why it says breakpoint one at, you know, whatever address. It, that happens to be the address of main, right? Line eight, it's talking about C source code, line eight. And now if I do that run again, you know, I've made my window sufficiently big in big text that I can't see all of my instructions at once, but what it's saying here is the first instruction of main, as far as it's concerned, is this uh, move, you know, EBP plus C into EAX. But you can see right there that this is actually main plus nine. So we're actually nine bytes into main at this point, at the very first point we, uh, we break. So if I wanted to, like, see what the very beginning of main looked like, for instance, I would have to then go back in and do something like x slash i dollar, oh well, x slash, say, 10i at main, something like that. So here, this is, you know, not going to be skipping over anything. This is just literally going to be replacing main with a specific address. And so if I do this command, and again, did I move this down again? If I do x slash 10i main and press return, okay, now this time it will, so it'll actually disassemble starting literally at the first address in main, and we can see that the breakpoint got set here at main plus 9. So GDB decided, well, the programmer doesn't really care about those first automatic compiler-generated instructions. They care about the stuff they wrote, right? So all of that got skipped, right? We have some push, EB, push EBP, the move ESP to EBP, we haven't seen this sort of construction before, this ending ESP with FFFF0. So I'll just say about that, that it's like, what is this trying to do, right? If the, if the least significant four bits are all zero, and we know that any time we end anything with zero, it's going to, uh, it's going to, you know, just be zero, then, well, I'm not going to do it on the board. It's basically going to say whatever the last four bits are, the last nibble of whatever ESP is right now, 
it's going to be turned into zero. So potentially ESP might get subtracted. Let's say ESP is, you know, BFF 00004, something like that. After this AND instruction, uh, that 4 is going to get wiped out as the last nibble. And so ESP is actually getting moved down a little bit. And what it's getting moved down to is a 16, uh, 16 byte aligned address. And this again is just one of those miscellaneous, you know, chalk it up to optimization things. If you go search through the Intel thing, it may say something about like, it's better if, you know, stack copies start on a 16 byte aligned address or something like that. So this is just GCC decided, hey, we're going to try to follow some optimization guidelines and we're going to try to, you know, align our stack for a 16 byte address, something like that. Anyways, I haven't seen that before, but then we get back to something, uh, something we've seen before. Subtract hex 20 from ESP because we're going to allocate space for local variables, right? And actually, this is more than enough space for local variables for reasons that we'll talk about later after we get back from lunch. So, let's go here, back at one. Any questions on the phone before we leave for lunch? All right.